Well, hello, beautiful people. So glad you could join us here at EncouragedToday.com. We have episode number two for you in our series in Encouraging Conversation. This episode has Christopher Hopper. Uh, Christopher's a different cat, man. So much going on in the uh, creativity and the imagination of this young man. Singer, songwriter, band leader with the Christopher Hopper Band, pastor, teacher, and currently he's taken on full-time the responsibility of storyteller. He's an accomplished author. Uh, Christopher will share a little bit of his brand new book with us during our conversation. So let's get right to it. This is an encouraging conversation with Christopher Hopper. Hey, Tony, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it's a real honor to talk to you and to speak to your viewers. This is really cool. So appreciate the opportunity. It's great having you today, my brother. Thanks. I'm going to start with a reading uh, from one of my books, actually. This is from my most recent novel that just came out. And um, maybe I'll talk about why I'm picking this <laughs> when I'm done reading it, <laughs> but I'll let it speak for itself for the moment. It says, and yet Forbes had the distinct impression that he was watching history unfold, a story he would tell his grandchildren in the age to come. I was there, he might say. I saw them with my own two eyes, walking through the wreckage like wraiths among the mist. As Forbes watched the pair move toward the hole in the plaza, he knew the galaxy's hope hung on their shoulders, on Piper's shoulders. She had a name. And the universe would remember it for all time. That was why he was here, why he was risking his life, so that people could go on living and hear about tales from long ago. So yeah, I, I chose this because it, it has a bit of melancholy to it, uh, and yet it references hope explicitly. And for me, Anthony, I feel like there's this, this tension that we live in, and specifically that Christians are called to live in, in which we're balancing the pain of the present uh, and acknowledging suffering, and yet looking toward a distant horizon and hope that awaits us. Yes. Um, and so I feel like this, this character in this moment, his name is Captain Forbes, and he's in the middle of this epic battle scene uh, toward the end of, of a nine-book series. Uh, and he's... You know, he's not shying away from the pain that he's experiencing uh, and the magnitude of what's happening. And yet he's kind of looking ahead to see his grandchildren and what he might tell them should he survive this and the role that he played in the writing of history, whether or not he recognized his importance. He still saw himself as, as intertwined with it and caught up with what was happening. Um, so I, I don't know. I just... I, ever since penning these words, I've had this, I always get like a, a little bit of a, a chill when I read it. So <laughs> is, is that good when that chill comes on you, my friend, knowing, kind of letting you know that you're on the right path by way of uh, where you're headed with your writing? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think they're, the two things that I look for whenever I'm writing uh, is that, that chill, like, ooh, that was special. Um, and to be honest with you, it is when I cry. <laughs> um, I, I'm not a big crier, but for some reason I am when I write novels. Yeah. Um, and there are several, if I feel like if I'm not crying at least once in the book <laughs> that I can't expect my readers to also feel something. A rewrite so, is needed if there's no tears shed, man. There it is. And we got to own that as men. It's, it's okay to, yeah. to let the waterworks fall. It's, it's uh, therapeutic. It's, it's good for the mental health, man. Absolutely. Christopher, Absolutely. you mentioned the word hope. Uh, as you know, to encourage is to support, is to give, to give hope to a person. Man, that earnest expectation of future good. We've always needed that. You know, Scripture tells us, I, I love how God reminds us, right? Hey, encourage one another. And because he knows he's dealing with his kids, he adds, while well, it's called today, do that today. 
uh, in Deuteronomy, we see, I put before you uh, life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. So he doesn't just say choose. He knows our hearts. Choose life. Encourage one another today. So there's that critical importance of lifting one another up, exhorting one another on a daily basis. Would you encourage us uh, in this moment, Christopher, with that future expectancy, Mm. uh, that earnest expectation of future hope? Because this is a different landscape where we're in here in July 2020. Uh, Why is hope so critical, my friend? Mm. Beautiful question. Um, I think I'm going to use an analogy because I'm a writer. So, (laughs) uh, and actually has to do with art itself. Uh, I've always been impressed with this line that has come from two of my favorite artists. Um, One is a painter and one is a writer. And they, they both share this similar expression that art has the power to forecast the world the way it ought to be. And, and I think expanding that a little bit further, good art has the ability to give us perspective on how the world works best. That's good. Um, and so fundamentally, hope has this transformational aspect where we recognize and we're not shying away from the facts of the reality around us. Uh, to do so, I think, is actually very disingenuous. And uh, it demeans people and their experiences and the reality of what they're going through. Um, But yet what hope does is it translates that in such a way that you go, okay, I I see what we're in, but hope demands that I see where we could be. And with God's help, again, because we're Christians, we recognize the intervention of the divine. And, And now it's not just us trying to make something happen. But we're being enabled through the power of the Spirit to see transformation move from just hope to future reality. Right. Um, and, and, it's, it. and it's not optimism, correct, Christopher? Correct. You know, yeah. we see how Abraham hoped against hope. So there's that natural hope of, man, I hope it doesn't rain next Wednesday. It'll hit that wall, but that supernatural hope of God, there's a little something different when that comes on the scene, eh? Yeah, for sure. Because I think that just pure optimism uh, is fundamentally uh, devoid of divine intervention. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. just, we're trying to, it's it's wishful thinking. Like, man, I hope that happens. That's that's very humanistic, I think, in nature. Whereas, Whereas divine inspired hope is, wait. God has perspective of how this all shakes out in the end. Therefore, if we have an ear tuned toward heaven, we're going to catch some of that reality. And it starts to infect the way we speak. And I think that's what, like the most hope-filled question, uh, Christians that I meet are those whose language and behavior somehow reflect something that I'm not touching yet. Like, yeah. ooh, how, mm. how do you – you're treating me differently <laughs> than people are treating me. Like, what is that? Um, <laughs> My son was recently in the hospital for something. He's good. Everything's great. But we were there for four days. uh, And we were talking about the power of the gospel and what is the nature of the gospel. And specifically, is the gospel data related? Like, you know, his question was, Dad, if I don't actually tell people about the gospel, are they going to hell? And it's it's a beautiful question, especially coming from my 13-year-old son. And we started dissecting that a little bit to the point where we arrived at the conclusion that the gospel is more about the presence of the kingdom being near Mm. than it is the minutia of the data that we've transferred mentally or intellectually. Right. So that he said, and this was his conclusion, we're in the hospital and there was a a nurse uh, who had just finished attending to him. She went out and before the door had finally closed all the way, he said, dad, I heard them talking to each other in the hallway. And they said, how are those two guys so kind? Mm. And it was just me and Luke, my son. And I said, and Luke, what do you think did that? Like, why would she say that? You think that was us just being nice? Because you know your dad, right? And, he's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I'm like, and I know you. And he goes, I said, so what were they really coming in contact with? And he said this, the gospel. Yes. And I was like, 
yes, you know, dad moment, like, yes. Um, but I think that's what the world really needs. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not some of the data that we say is essential. And that's important. The, the details are important, sure. but it's more the manifestation of this hope personified right. that really has a lasting impact on who that, we are as people. That, that reflection of light and love as opposed to, as you say, Christopher, a mental ascent to specific facts, but a person actually living out and having fruit from that source of mm. life that, that the branch is connected to the vine and, and that kindness, as you say, it isn't so much something in our DNA, but it comes from being grafted uh, into the, the, the life source of, of the living God. You know, you brought up a couple of points, my friend, and that is that hope doesn't deny natural facts, uh, that it actually will stare them in the, in the eyeball and say, in spite of you, uh, God has good and God has kindness planned for for me and my home. One of the things I was excited about, Christopher, bringing you on is you're a critical thinker, my brother. So how do we face this in July of 2020? Let's say in the area of uh, schools opening back up. Uh, Mm -hmm. You're a father of four. And as the saying goes, Mm -hmm. your wife is a mother of five. So uh, <laughs> how, right. are you, how are you guys processing this, man? This, this isn't easy. How can we encourage our listeners with the school year coming up around the corner and be critical thinking, thinking for ourselves as we got to make some, uh, some life decisions for our families? Man. Well, Anthony, I don't have the answers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, thank I you for know. joining us today. We're so <laughs> glad you... <laughs> Uh, and I, I tend to think of it, it's like, it's kind of like one beggar telling another beggar where they found food for the day. That's it, man. Um, today it might be me, tomorrow it might be you, and on, over the weekend it's going to be somebody else. Um, sure. But what we, little light we have, we share. So um, we're in this place of, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to go back. I, focusing on Jesus, which is always a good thing. I think his incarnation is so, uh, and and this is going to (laughs) sound so so cliche, it's so profound because of all the things that God could have done, he incarnates a, a stinky case, like one that needs a shower and needs to be trimmed and has weird smells and needs to go to the doctor um, I had, I had a plastic surgeon once remove a, a little growth on my ear and he said, ah, we're like a garden. We all need a trim from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's so gross and, and very fitting. And true. <laughs> and true. And so I love, first of all, that Jesus is not, he is not put off by this stuff. Uh, he's not surprised by anything. Like I just saw a great meme yesterday, which was the countdown to 2020 from you know, New Year's Eve 2019, and then all hell breaks loose <laughs> in this meme. And it, it's, we got to laugh out of it because it's almost so sad. You have to laugh. Right. And, and the, the implication was, wow, in 2019, we got really sideswiped. We, we had no idea what was coming. We all got surprised. Holy cow. If we could go back and do this again, we all would. Right. And yet God was not surprised. And, and there's something really beautiful there because I feel like the more we're tapped into, and I guess that's a kind of a cliche too, the more we're focused on, on Jesus, on what it means to be cruciform in nature, meaning mm-hmm. sacrificial in nature, yeah. the more we realize this stuff really isn't that jarring. And I realized that statement could sound very, very numb. And and I don't mean it to be. I have friends, we've had friends who've died from COVID. We have friends who are currently embroiled in protests and fighting for things they passionately believe in. We have people um, across the world. We were just talking to a friend of ours in Cambodia. Like, forget what we think is turmoil in the United States. Cambodia. And, and, And so... I think what we've been trying to communicate to our children as we look at, at um, September and the return to school here in New York is, hey, kids, we're going to take it one day at a time. We don't know enough to worry about tomorrow. 
And Jesus said, tomorrow already has enough carriers. Mm. You know, um, f- today has enough carriers of its own. We're not called. I, I, I don't even know that I'm going to be alive tomorrow. <laughs> as fatalistic as that sounds, I'm not promised it. No, so we ha- what can I do today to ensure love and peace in my home, to let my closest friends know, not, not my social media friends, unless a few of them happen to be my closest, but my actual tactile closest friends know I love them and that I am trying with the best of my ability to champion efforts that I think contribute to society, whether that's the society in my downstairs living room right now, or it's a society with my next door neighbor who needed something from me yesterday, or maybe my small community. And so in a weird way, like my, I think as we let our lives contract a little bit and take our eyes off of the national scale, not mm-hmm. saying we're not supposed to be responsible or be good, you know, have a civic duty in mind, sure. but really at the end of the day, it's that expression, all politics are local. I think the kingdom is local. Yeah. And let me worry here and now with the things that I actually can affect. And as I have energy and time, I'll let that kind of trickle out and bleed. That's so. Good, huh? I don't even know. I don't even know what our school district is doing yet. Therefore, how can I even worry about it? And if I do, all I'm really doing is elevating the anxiety of myself and my household mm-hmm. until we have facts and figures to talk about. So, I don't know. It's kind of like this, this study in redactive reasoning. I'm just I'm stepping away. I'm subtracting things in order to get clear headspace to focus on the necessary things. Mm-hmm. You're, you're taking away in order to gain kind of sounds like um, uh, when, you, uh, when you go to a plant and you deadhead it and you prune that plant that some has to be taken in, away in order for more to come. That sounds like wisdom, my brother. I, I, I like that practical uh, application. So as we're progressing in 2020, like you say, we're not quite sure what next week is, is going to hold. Um, how would you encourage uh, our listeners? And Christopher, what are you seeing by way of how we're supposed to support one another? Uh, Our neighbor is that person whose feet are in front of us. What are you seeing in this hour, my brother, by way of followers of Christ doing this very thing, living this out with what has been put into our hands? Hey, Support one mm. another, man. Encourage mm. one another. What are your eyeballs seeing? Even though it's hard, man, because are you guys still online with your community, Christopher? Are you guys meeting in inside four walls yet or still predominantly online? Yeah, we're predominantly online. Um, just started uh, physical services two weeks ago, but yeah. at a highly, highly reduced rate. Um, right. You can, you can, with an app, you can actually reserve your seat, but it's at a 20% capacity per service. Um, and a lot of people are very hesitant to sell to come out, obviously. Sure. Some are gung-ho. Um, so so with, the, with those differences, Christopher, someone yeah. coming in, some not wanting to come in, uh, what are you seeing by way of the encouragement we're extending to one another in this landscape? Is it, is it flowing? Have you seen it kind of brought back a little bit? Uh, what, what are you seeing, my brother? Yeah. So I, I was, I, I, I wrote something in my journal today. I want to read it to you. Please. Uh, the passion with which we champion any cause reveals our trust in its salvific power to redeem us. So probably said a little more simply that passion is a revelation of salvation. Mm. When I, when I look at the landscape and I, and I, again, browse social media, which I, choose to do once a day now for about three minutes because most of it is really other focused rather than being in a healthy way, self focused and God focused. Um, I, I am astounded at the, the measure with which people champion causes that they truly believe will redeem them that have nothing mm-hmm. to do with the redeemer. Interesting. And so I really think that passion becomes a metric by which we can tell, wow, that person might say this about themselves or might say that about themselves, but based on the passion with which they argue for fill in the blank, I think they're more of a follower of this thing or that thing or that movement or this party or, you know, fill in the blank as you wish than 
Jesus. The kingdom, right? Than the kingdom. Uh, and so my advice might be, and I, <laughs> I firmly believe that all unsolicited advice is an exercise <laughs> in anxiety. However, you did ask, so I offer. I'm asking, my um, brother. You have an opportunity here. No, there's no weight on you whatsoever. Thank you. <laughs> so I would maybe say this. Examine the passion with which you champion things in your life. I like that. That's good. And follow, you know, we'd, we'd say if we're writing a novel, follow the money trail, and that's going to tell you who's pulling the strings. Follow the passion trail. If you find that the thing you're most passionate about really doesn't have anything to do with the Jesus you read in scripture or the kingdom way of working through life, then I suggest maybe a revision is needed. And for you to step back and go, Wait, you know what, I need to, I need to reassess some priorities. I've, mm -hmm. For instance, I recently had friends admit to me, you know, I realize I have been more of a nationalist than a Christian. Mm -hmm. What a profound statement. Yeah, yeah. Um, others have said, I, I've, I've discovered through my examining my passion that I'm more passionate about preserving my own self than I am serving mm -hmm. people in jeopardy. Yeah. Wow. Checking, my, checking my own borders. God, I, I need help with my kingdom today, which, of course, he's not too interested in at all. <laughs> you know. Right. And so, and I think a good, so anyway, all that to say that while we can look at all sorts of metrics, I think there's an interesting one that has to do with passion. Oh, that's good. Examine, examine the passion and see where it leads you and make corrections as needed because, oh my goodness, some, you know, somebody recently argued, well, I, I haven't changed my views in 25 years. I'm like, dude, I changed mine like routinely. And, and so while they champion that as, some sort of, you know, the rigidity is the bulwark with which they can test their resolve. Mine is, wow, Jesus, please change me. <laughs> That's right. Please make me more like you. So. Yeah. Haven't changed in 20. Jeez, I'm sorry to hear that, man. You know. <laughs> That's a great response. <laughs> my, I'm sorry. Um, you know, Socrates <laughs> said the, the unexamined life isn't worth mm -hmm. living. So. This self-examination, you know, as the light is shown upon these shadow areas, these dark areas that we need to bring out, it's, it's a journey of adjustments, uh, isn't it, Christopher? Mm, uh, you know, good. being a coach in softball, if a hitter is off just a little bit, we don't need to uh, go 180 with uh, the with changing of how you approach your hitting. Little mm. adjustments. Bring your hands up a little bit higher. Maybe that mm. elbow back. And uh, in this... Uh, walk that we're on with Jesus uh, is the same. It, it, it adjustments can be made. So how can we encourage our listeners to think for ourselves, to self-examine, and then have that passion come out of those areas as opposed to having it come out of a political ideology or a political agenda? Mm. I believe it comes from self-examination with the help of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Classical Christianity would, would call this spiritual formation. Yeah. Jesus warned in scripture, he warned the disciples. It was, a, I think, something they didn't quite catch. And I think we can miss it too if we're not careful. He said, I want you to be careful of the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees. And breaking, breaking that down exegetically, what he was really saying is, I want you to be careful of a political spirit, number one, mm. and a religious spirit, number two. The political spirit always tries to distance itself from impurity. That's why whenever, you know, someone in a party does something that the rest of the party could be harmed by, all of a sudden it's, well, he or she doesn't represent us, and it's get as far away as you can from them. And the, the religious spirit tends to act like God is in control when really it wants to be in control. Mm. And I think Jesus's point in all of it was saying, okay, both this political spirit and this religious spirit are not the third spirit, which is what I want you to have, which is my Holy Spirit. Right. And so when I see people betray 
basic human decency mm. on the grounds of a political or religious plank. That is always the red flag that's waving yeah. in the air going, this is not the Holy Spirit. That's good. And what's really fascinating to me, Anthony, is how many people who are not Christians, uh, I was just talking to a friend, my, a friend of mine the other day, is an atheist, like does not believe God exists at all. He's probably more of a nihilist, <laughs> has a better understanding of what it means to be a decent human being than people who tow the party line of Christianity. And, uh, and so that's, that's where I think, you know, other things that Jesus said that are mysterious, like, hey, the children of, of the darkness, not the children of light, know how to operate in some of these things better than you guys. Mm-hmm. Well, if that's not a stone thrown at us, I don't know what is. In right. other words, he's saying, I want you to embody the kingdom in such a way that you don't make sense. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just, but, but there's still this element that the world looks at it and goes, Ooh, I really like that. Right. And so, I don't know, I, I, it's kind of this, this, like we were talking about with passion and self-examination, I think behavioral self-examination is, is critical. And going, again, does this really, does this ring true with the Jesus I know? Maybe like two more little points here, if you don't mind. Yes. The, the Jesus and the, 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 the Samaritan woman at the well. Longest conversation recorded in the New Testament is done with a woman and with a Samaritan woman, a a quote-unquote half-breed who does not belong. Jesus is breaking all sorts of rules with this. She's also the first person in Scripture who's actually commissioned to go bring the gospel, Mm -hmm. which blows my mind. And that, that has its grounds all the way back to Rahab in the Old Testament, who was the very first person to name Yahweh, to name God. Like, if we think about the implications of that, that God would allow a woman to be the one who names him. And, and especially I, if we looked at Rahab's business card. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is so provocative and so astounding. And, you, you know, you'll get theologians that, not theologians, excuse me, I won't say that. I believe most theologians won't, wash, won't whitewash that. Right. Um, you'll have people who will whitewash that. And so that's, again, that's another red flag. So when, when I, you know, hear this story of what happens on, on the congressional floor, I'm going, wow, we're, th- this just comes back to being a decent human being and the ultimate decent human being was and always will be Jesus. Yeah. So, and I'm apolitical like you, so I, I don't know if I'm, I'm much to ask on this because <laughs> I pulled my party card years ago. I just yeah. said, nah, you don't, you don't get my vote just because I, I checked the box. You got to work for it. Yeah, beautifully uh, put, my brother. Listen, I think we solved all the world's problems. Our listeners shouldn't have any, <laughs> uh, any kind of uh, confusion after they get done with this, this conversation. None. My brother. <laughs> Thanks Would for you, having me so much. Oh, it's been, uh, it's been a joy, and, uh, and I knew a couple of laughs were coming, and they did. I appreciate your heart, Christopher. Leave us with an encouraging word, my brother. Well, actually, can I pray for everybody? Please. Does that, that work? Heavenly Father, we are so aware of how amazing you are in these days and how futile sometimes the things that we're engaged with seem, how flawed our behaviors can be because uh, for me, I feel like I, I don't go a day without asking forgiveness from somebody for something, including you. And so father, in light of your preeminence and perfection and in light of our weakness and fragility, we just ask for your governance and guidance in our lives, a fresh and a new that you would take that rightful place in our hearts on the throne of who we are and, and you would be the loving, sovereign, guiding father that we desperately need in these days. Bring comfort to those whose anxieties are pushing them toward the brink. Bring encouragement to those who just don't really feel like going on right now. And 
most of all, that your hope would rule and reign in us, in our hearts and minds, that we would be able to say, you know what, Jesus, I might not have much today, but I do have you, and you are always enough. In Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today at EncouragedToday.com. This has been an encouraging conversation with Christopher Hopper.